Hello, hello. Thank you for joining me. It's George Al Mastery, and you're tuning in to the Well Off Podcast, uh, where today I interviewed Andy Tran, who is the founder of Sweet Editions. Him and his company focus on adding secondary units or garden suites to existing properties. He's a registered house and small buildings designer, an investor, a developer, and holds a degree in architectural science. And uh, on this episode, we talked a lot about uh, Andy's journey. He actually came to Canada as a refugee with his family, and he started off as a home inspector um, a couple years ago and realized that a lot of people were asking him about basement apartments, whether they were legal, and he just didn't have the answer. So that motivated him to find out uh, more information about that. And that's what he does today. They they specialize in creating legal secondary suites and in helping people put up what's now considered a garden suite or even laneway housing. So these are relatively new concepts and Andy and his team have been uh, focusing on this stuff for a few years now. So tons of information here for you guys. Uh, he, he mentioned that a lot of properties will allow garden suites. And if you want to find out more, I encourage you guys to reach out to him or even just call the city of whatever uh, whatever city you're in. Call their hotline and find out if you can put in a garden suite or a laneway house at your property. So I know you guys are going to enjoy this. It's jam-packed with information. Andy's a very knowledgeable guy and I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope you'll find great value. And if you do, please be sure to share this with your friends and family. Let somebody know about this episode and make sure to leave us a review on iTunes or on the Apple podcast platform. That would be greatly appreciated. And if you guys want to connect with me, I encourage you to go to welloff.ca, book a call. Let's chat. Let's connect. And here you go. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Wall Off podcast where the goal is to motivate, inspire, and share success principles. I'm here with Andy Tran from Sweet Editions. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys know him. So uh, Andy, welcome. I appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, absolutely, George. Thanks for uh, having me on. Great. Uh, so I like to start off, I don't know if you've ever <laughs> listened to any other episode, but I always start off by asking about your childhood. So where you grew up, one or <laughs> two things you remember. Uh, so just tell us a few a few things that you remember. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I got to go way, way back, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm, a, I'm an immigrant. Um, so uh, I was not born in Canada. So I came to Canada uh, as a actual as a refugee um, uh, when I was uh, four or five years old. And uh, we actually uh, first thing we did was we settled in Saskatchewan. Um, it was I just remember it was really cold because uh, we were in Hong Kong at the time, and it was just it was just freezing cold. So I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't accustomed to it. And uh, eventually we uh, we made our way. Uh, to Toronto, which is where uh, my parents found work at the time, uh, blue collar type of work, and you know, pretty much have have been here ever since. Awesome! I had no idea. That's that's really cool. That's a cool uh, journey. So from Hong Kong to Saskatchewan to Toronto. Yes. Yeah. Cool. And and we stayed in some uh, pretty um, questionable uh, basement suites at the time. I'm sure they were not done legally. Yeah, for sure. There's still tons of those. <laughs> Um, so then, so I guess then you went to Ryerson or, uh, was it Ryerson or U of T that you studied and got your architectural degree? Yeah, I studied uh, architectural science at Ryerson mm -hmm. and, uh, that's really kind of exposed me to, you know, basically, uh, the construction industry and how, how to go about, uh, you know, building houses and, and buildings, uh, in Ontario and Canada. So where did that interest come from? Was that just like, was it because you lived in a lot of basement apartments and, you know, you didn't like how things were or were done or, uh, what was the motivation for, for going into that and getting that degree? Yeah. I mean that, uh, when it came to basement apartments, it, it took, it took, uh, it took a while for me to kind of realize that. Um, but it was just from an early age, kind of really interested in, uh, art and drawing and, uh, you know, just having a conversation with my dad one day and he says, you know, since you like drawing so much, um, you know, there's a way to you know, draw uh, houses and make money from that. And then I said, oh, okay, you know, let me get into architecture. So that's kind mm -hmm. of the path that I took. Um, although it was not a straight path, I kind of went around a few different um, industries before I kind of settled on, uh, you know, being a house designer. Yeah, for sure. And I think I read somewhere that you started, you bought your first rental in 2010. Is that right? Uh, yeah. First uh, sort of single family rental property was 2010. Yeah. Okay. So tell us a little bit about how your, your business came together. How did you start focusing on second suite, legal second suites and garden suites and all these other things that you're doing now? 
Sure. Yeah. So it happened a, a bit before that. Um, I uh, was in the home inspection industry uh, from around 2006 to around 2010, 2011. And during that time, you know, as I was inspecting houses in Toronto, I was always kind of asked the question as I have this suite here, can I legally rent it out? And I never really had the answers for them. Um, all, all I would say is, you know, you have to check with your realtor, check with your lawyer, call the city, but they really wouldn't get enough information. And so when I started seeing these questions pop up over and over again, I, I thought to myself, maybe there's, there's an opportunity here to serve a particular market uh, that, you know, where, where uh, you know, a need was not being served. So that's when I started researching a little bit more, got into kind of, um, you know, even though I had an understanding of house construction and, and design, I didn't have a good understanding of urban planning and what's involved in kind of converting houses from a uh, sort of a zoning perspective. And I dug into it. I actually uh, purchased my uh, principal residence, which I'm living in right now, uh, in 2009. And I went through the legal conversion process for that property first in 2009 and 2010. And sort of through that experience, um, I started using that, you know, in my in my work where I was uh, giving, you know, my clients, my home inspection clients and energy auditing, auditing clients more information related to doing a legal conversion. Mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of talks at realtors offices and just realized over time um, and also being within the investment community uh, that I saw this as being a potential, you know, opportunity that could be very lucrative, you know, just because, you know, where, where things were going with house prices. And this was 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously that kind of played out uh, nicely. And um, uh, in 2015, I decided to kind of take this thing more serious, um, you know, registered a company, start doing consulting and designs, and then really went full time in 2016. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. We've been kind of doing a ton of these, these second suites. Um, and then, of course, now with more densification, with more, you know, just um, runaway house prices, the, the, the demand is higher for densification of, of existing housing. Yeah, for sure. Um, so as you're speaking, because I know you do a lot of work in like Hamilton and uh, certain parts of the, the Niagara region, like St. Catharines or, or Welland or whatever else. Um, but for, for Hamilton, I've seen, I've come across, I'm sure you have too, a lot of these uh, century homes that are two and a half story buildings, and they're used as like three or four unit properties, but they're, they're zoned as a single family home. Mm -hmm. Is it possible? And I, obviously it's case by case, but have you ever come across a situation where someone was able to convert that single family home into a, a legal fourplex? And let's say it's currently in a, in a D zone or something like that. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And something that I, uh, I, I get a lot uh, of people asking me is, you know, can they convert this older, you know, century home in a core neighborhood to have, let's say three or four units and the first thing you have to look at is the zoning, right? So you mentioned D zone. Yeah. Um, Hamilton's a little bit different in, in the way they kind of have zoning. So really most cities will have sort of an R1, R2, R1 being kind of the lowest density suburban type housing. And then R2 would be slightly higher density, right? And, and so you have to look at the zoning first. So I believe D zone still really only allows two units. Yeah. And if you want to do a legal conversion of, you know, to three or four units, you would you would then have to go for a zoning amendment with yeah. the city, right? And and um, a zoning amendment is different from a minor variance. A zoning amendment is more involved, and uh, it's uh, it's not it's definitely not guaranteed mm -hmm. uh, because you are saying that right now I'm going to change the density of my lot uh, that is going to be different from from the other houses here. But it really depends what has taken precedent, right? Has somebody else gone through that process nearby, and there's you know multiple three four units. Um, that's the one thing you have to look at and, and, you know, you have to be careful also of, um, kind of existing and quote unquote legal, le legal, non-conforming, or, you know, the, these terms that people throw around like grandfathering of units, um, those sort of things you have to be careful about because, you know, when you buy the house and it already has a three or four units, you don't know when that actually took place. You know, yeah. did it happen five years ago or did it happen, you know, 40 years ago? And if the city looks at it and they don't have any records of it being converted at any time in history, they're just going to treat it as a non-legal uh, non unit right now. 
and they may have the ability to ask you to remove the additional units, right? Right. So you just have to be very careful when you're when you're out there looking at property. Sure. Um, so a couple things. Um, you, you mentioned like going back in history and kind of figuring out if it was converted at some point or when. Do you have any tips on how somebody could do that? Like I know some people have said go to the local library and uh, try to find old phone books where they may have had several people registered under the same property address. Or uh, is there like any any sort of tips or tricks <laughs> That's that a good you strategy. have? I've never heard that. Maybe <laughs> I'll try that myself sometime. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the first thing really is, you know, ask the current seller if they do have any documentation. Sometimes, sometimes it's going to be there. Um, if you contact, most cities will have a record of what is registered under that property. So they may have what's called a zoning verification report yeah. that will indicate what that property is registered at. And ultimately, that's what matters, what the city has it registered as, right? Mm -hmm. And if the city has it registered as something, as something else, let's say, you know, you have this property that's three or four units and, uh, you know, you've been, uh, it's, you know, you have um, good evidence that, you know, that was done before any of the current bylaws applied to that area, but yet the city only has it as a single family or the two unit, you know, it's incumbent on you as a homeowner to prove to the city that it is, you know, it is, it's, let's say a legal non-conforming three units or four units. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not, it's not incumbent on the city to kind of meet meet what you know you want it to be designated as sure. right definitely and ultimately yeah. you know the risk kind of it goes back to the to the homeowner yeah now if you were to go down the path of doing a zoning amendment uh what kind of timeline and procedure would follow in that situation like do you have to uh, get approval from the municipality and all the neighbors have to approve and like this and that or, or what's the process like yeah, I mean, you would have to uh, apply for that process with the city, and every city has their own schedules, right? Depending on how busy they are, it could be weeks or it could be months. Um, the zoning amendment is a uh, a process where your neighbors would be notified, right? So whether it's a minor variance or a zoning amendment, uh, your neighbors are notified and have the ability to voice their concerns. And uh, these days, you know, with the pandemic, a lot of that has been, you know, transferred from in person to online. Yeah. Um, so there's there's both positives and negatives, right? The positive is that it's a lot more convenient, right? So I'm able to uh, represent my clients uh, uh, to do, you know, basic minor variances, you know, through the, you know, uh, say a YouTube live stream. Um, and the negative is that there's there's potentially going to be more neighbors because it's so convenient for them to sure. kind of show up and, uh, you know, voice their opinion, positive or negative. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just sort of one thing to consider. And, um, you know, a lot of the projects we do, uh, we focus on as of right construction mostly, which means that we try to, we try to stay within the bylaws as much as possible and mm -hmm. not deviate too much away from them um, so that we can avoid going through that minor variance process. Because even if let's say, you know, you're doing everything above board and, you know, you're asking for a minor variance because your neighbors are potentially involved, you know, even if there's nothing wrong with what you're trying to do, you know, they may kind of use that as leverage to, you know, um, express their distaste for, for your project, right? Yeah. Even if it's kind of unrelated to the, to the uh, special permission that you're asking for, right? Sure. You know, maybe it's only like you're off by a few inches with parking, uh, but yet, you know, your neighbor may not like the fact that you're doing a two unit or a three unit conversion yeah. for whatever reason. And, and, you know, they will try to use these things, kind of pit that against you. Right. So for sure, for sure. we always encourage people to, as much as possible, try to stay within the, within the bylaws and look for properties that, you know, have a high likelihood where you can actually stay within, within those rules. Okay, for sure. Uh, so with regards to a zoning amendment, what kind of timelines are you looking at start to finish now to get uh, get a result? Yes, we're going to approve the, the zoning amendment or no, we won't. Is that a couple months? Is it a year? Is it two years? Yeah, I mean, the, I, I haven't done one in a long time, but uh, it's uh, I would say it's kind of in the months type of. Yeah, right? okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other question I had now, let's say we go back. I know we're kind of focusing on this. We'll talk about garden suites a little bit soon, but uh, let's say you've got, um, let's say like a three unit, a triplex or a legal non-conforming, whatever with an unfinished basement. Mm -hmm. Are you able to finish the basement and make it part of 
the main floor unit? Like, w- would you run into issues with zoning or anything like that if if you decide to do something like that? Obviously, you'd have to get permits and whatnot. But w- what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you mean just having like a, a finished space with without a separate unit, like no kitchen or anything like that, just part of the main yeah. Unit? Uh, yeah, because I think there's supposed to be like a, a height requirement. If you're adding the, if you're including the basement with the main floor unit, it's supposed to be like 84 inches or something like that from what I've heard. Well, there's height requirements for any finished space, right? Whether yeah. it's a separate suite or whether it's just a finished, finished space for your own personal use. Right. So in the basement on an existing house, the minimum is, uh, is, uh, roughly six feet, five inches. Right. Okay. Um, And so, you know, whether that is a separate basement suite with its own kitchen and, you know, all other living facilities, or whether it's a a rec room or a family room as part of the main unit, it has to have that minimum height. So there's no issues with that. You can, you can configure the actual structure, however you like, as long as it complies with the building code and the bylaws, right? So the bylaws may say the second unit cannot be more than 40% of the gross floor area. Uh, mm-hmm. Or it cannot, you know, um, uh, uh, there needs to be, um, you know, uh, no more than X number of bedrooms, like two yeah. bedrooms or something like that. So as long as you can comply with that and you're able to comply with the building code, you can have your main unit or second unit anywhere in the house, right? So yeah. the majority of what we've done is basements, uh, uh, second suites have been in the basement, but we've also done ones where the second suite is on the second floor and the third sure. floor yeah. or, re- or a rear addition, right? Yeah. And then of course, you know, we have the potential for these uh, accessory units, which are detached as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So why don't we talk about these accessory units? I know they have different names, like in Toronto, I guess it's laneway suites and uh, there's garden suites and all that. So um, what can you share with us about garden suites? Are these particular to certain areas, certain cities? Yeah. So garden suites is actually a term that is more kind of like uh, a, a marketing term. Um, they're, they're officially known as additional residential units, right? Mm-hmm. So again, there's all these different names for them. People call them granny flats, coach houses. Um, you know, in the, in the U.S., it's more, mostly known as detached ADUs, detached accessory dwelling units. And so the big kind of policy change happened in 2019 with the provincial government passing Bill 108, the, the More Homes, More Choice Act, which essence, essentially requires that all municipalities allow these uh, additional Um, garden suites as third units. So in addition to your main house and your second suite, they allow them as third units, right? Um, It's going to take years for every city or town to comply with the rules, but there are already a handful of cities and towns in Ontario that that already has complied. And um, so in Toronto, you know, laneway houses are are specific to properties that are adjacent to laneways, whereas Toronto actually will be officially calling garden suites ones that are uh, in just people's backyards, right? Sure. So the difference there is that, you know, it's it's a big difference because there's only a limited number of properties that have laneway access, mm-hmm. right? There's one or two orders of magnitude more properties with, um, you know, backyards that can have garden suites compared to houses with laneway suites, right? So if you have, you know, 50,000 properties that can have laneway suites, you know, you, you might have, you know, 500,000 properties that can have actual garden suites in the backyard. Can you have both? Can you have a laneway suite and a garden suite? Uh, most likely not. Um, I mean, it's really going to be only one detached structure. Okay. Right? So if you, if your house is on a laneway, you have, you've built a laneway house. Uh, most likely the only thing you can do is, is put in, um, you know, a, a one or two additional second units in the main house as part of that structure but not have another, not like have another detached unit, right? Okay. So it's really going to be um, either garden suite or laneway house. Yeah. Uh, is, your- is Toronto the only city that has allowed laneway housing or are there other, other cities as well? Uh, in Ontario, Hamilton does allow them. So they do have policies in place in Hamilton, although uh, recently they've had a new SDU policy, which effectively is the garden suite policy that kind of takes over their old laneway house policy. So whether you have a laneway or... Uh, just a backyard without laneway access, you can have a detached structure uh, in the back of your house. And that's, yeah. that's currently effective right now in Hamilton. Okay. And is that, is that something you can add to any property um, or is like, are there, is there specific criteria that would allow you or prevent you from putting in that, that accessory dwelling? 
Yeah, I, I would say the majority of properties will probably comply, but you know there are going to be limitations, right? So there are bylaws to say what the setback requirements are, what the height restrictions are, what the size of the units are going to be. So at, at the end of the day, it really comes down to the size and configuration of your property, right? If you mm -hmm. have a very shallow or very narrow lot, it might not work or it might not be feasible. If you have a large lot, deep lot, maybe a corner lot, then it's going to make a lot more sense, right? Um, so I would say that probably if I had to take a guess, the majority of properties will work, but um, I don't think all of them will. And then in some cases, you know, you might be kind of, you know, on the fence there in terms of whether or not it's going to work based on the bylaws. And, and you know, if you decide that you're going to exceed, uh, you're going to ask for, you know, a little bit extra permission to, you know, let's say make it a little bit bigger or less of a setback, then you would just go through that minor variance process. And and, um, you know, for the most part, if it is going to be truly minor in nature, what you're asking for, then you shouldn't have any issues with getting that um, approved mm -hmm. on the committee of adjustments. Okay. Now, uh, for any investors that are listening to this, why would an investor want to put a garden suite or a laneway house or whatever other names there are out there? Right. Them? Yeah, well, there's there's a ton of different reasons, right? Uh, so from an investment standpoint, uh, obviously that really boosts your your um, cash flow, right? Your your income levels. Uh, your you know if you're buying a single family home and you're putting in the second suite, which is a great great strategy, and it's a strategy that you know I and many of my clients have used is put in the second suite. You know you're you're boosting your cash flow from single income to you know double income on the property. Now you're adding this third one. Uh, you know, you're, you're basically, you know, it's three times that income, right? Now, um, the one thing to consider is that, yes, you know, this, the, the money that you're using to build this, you can purchase another property, but that may not be feasible because of, you know, you don't, you may not want to over leverage. Uh, you know, the great thing about the garden suite is that you're building, you're, you're essentially doing a small scale development on land that you already own um, that is very limited in terms of development costs. For the most part, all you're looking at is a building permit, mm -hmm. um, and then obviously, uh, you know, other other um, uh, minor nominal costs with the city. But it's different from, you know, building building uh, a house off of land that you severed or you know raw land that you purchased. Right? There's a lot more that goes into that process uh, before you can actually do the do the actual construction. So yeah. So there's definitely benefits there. So I would say the primary benefit is this quote unquote free land that you already have with that property uh, that you can effectively, you know, build on right away. Yeah. And based on like different people that I've spoken to and whatnot, I think it costs, it could cost anywhere between like two to 300,000 typically to do a project like this. Now for somebody, if they don't have the, the funds in cash or whatever available to them to, to complete this project, are you aware of any sort of programs that can assist them, any uh, building financing or uh, construction loans or anything like that, that can, that can assist with the costs? Yeah, absolutely. There are, there are lenders right now that are uh, looking at providing these types of uh, products for, for uh, homeowners and investors. Um, you know, you have, you have to, th there's like none of the, none of the big banks are looking into this yet. I, mm -hmm. I, my guess is that in a few years when they see the numbers, it's going to start making sense to them. But right now it's more alternate lenders and credit unions and things like that, that are looking at this, uh, to get construction finance, right. You still have to be able to prove that this is something that you have the capability of doing, uh, is to do construction and, you know, either show them your past experience uh, so that's, that's the one thing that any, any lender that is going to lend you money to do construction, they're going to want to know that you have some experience, right? So you mm -hmm. may want to potentially partner with someone that has experience, uh, or, you know, hire a, a builder that has experience to do the work. And uh, that's something that, that is available from some lenders, but you might have to do some shopping around, or if you have a good mortgage broker, they may have some private lending available. You know, if you don't have the cash or you don't have, uh, you know, home equity line of credit in order to finance the construction. Yeah. Uh, so I know in the past when sometimes people, when, uh, when people have done legal second suites, they've had a hard time getting full market value um, on the reef on the refi because the appraisals are coming in low appraisers. Weren't really aware of the differences between legal and non-legal and whatever. 
Um, are you finding that that's still happening these days or is it better are appraisers catching on and realizing that there is like quite a bit of a difference between legal and non-legal units and also potentially with these garden suites as well? Yeah, so from the second suite standpoint, I, I would say that uh, it's definitely gotten better. Uh, they do recognize the value of legal, especially if some lenders are actually asking for documentation as well. Okay, uh, but when they are doing the appraisal, a lot of them are still using the uh, the, the sales comparison approach and not yeah. necessarily the income approach when they're doing their uh, when they're using you know certain criteria for 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 their appraised value. Yeah, and the fact is the majority of buyers out there are still um, you know end users, right? Owner occupied buyers. And owner-occupied buyers may not be as discerning from legal or non-legal status. Mm -hmm. and, and so they may be willing to pay for a house that is, uh, you know, an illegal unit. Um, they may, you know, and you compare that against one that is legal. And first of all, there aren't even that many legal ones yeah. on the market, right? Most of the legal ones that are, that are on the market are already held by investors. Uh, the vast majority of our clients, once they've legalized it, they hang on to that property and they yeah. just keep collecting the, the, the rent money, right? So there's not a huge amount to compare against. So to answer your question, I would say that it's gotten better, but it's still, I, I would st still say that it is uh, the exception that there's going to be a significant uh, boost in appraised value given the fact that it's legal, right? It's more yeah. of a long-term thing. And, and most people are able to extract their, you know, at least their renovation funds after, you know, about a year. Okay, cool. And I know this is like a pretty uh, new topic, this whole garden suites thing. Have, have you completed any garden suites to this at this point? I, I know I'm assuming you have a couple projects in progress, but has anything been totally completed? Uh, yeah, we, we have a few projects right now in progress. Um, mm -hmm. We are struggling a little bit when it comes to figuring out uh, things like utility connections and all that. So uh, we're working on a few projects for, you know, I, I'm, I have a couple of projects and then we ha also have projects with our clients and none of them actually have been completed. But, you know, if we talk again in six months or a year, I'm sure that there's going to yeah. be, there's going to be a lot uh, that have been completed at that yeah. time. Yeah, I'm really curious to see how appraisers will will value these properties with the garden suites because it's, it's a brand new concept. So it, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Yeah, yeah. And, and as an investor, you actually have to educate your appraiser and show them, you know, yeah. what you're doing, the numbers. And I've heard of some investors where the appraisers have appraised the the house as a triplex um, because there are three separate legal units, even yeah. though there's not one building. Yeah, for sure. Um, so where do you see your, your company going? Like, I know you guys are busy. You have a lot of clients. You have a lot of projects on the go. Uh, do you see yourself continuing to focus on these types of projects or, or is there a different direction you're going in in the near future? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're going to continue to do what we're, we've been doing for the past several years, which is to help homeowners and, and, and investors you know, legalize their second units because that's really the lowest hanging fruit. Obviously, you want to improve the property as much as possible with cosmetic improvements. Um, but then, you know, we want to encourage more and more people to do the garden suites because we think that that's a, a great uh, uh, you know, revenue generator. It can be very profitable. And then B, you're adding additional housing units to the market, which is what we desperately need, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we're also looking at the small scale infill developments, you know, severing lots, building new houses. Uh, we're also uh, spending a lot of uh, time looking into the prefab space and seeing how we can incorporate that into our model, because there's a lot of exciting things happening around there, you know, with automation, with with robotics and things like that. So the you know, with this increased demand as a result of a lot of these policy changes that in turn, I believe, is going to create the demand uh, you know, for more, more innovative building methods compared to, you know, just your on-site stick frame construction. Sure. Yeah. Prefab, that's, that's another really cool uh, concept. And I think that's probably going to be used more and more often, especially with garden suites and whatever else. Um, Correct. Yeah. So if people are interested in looking at their properties and seeing if it's feasible to put a, a garden suite or a laneway house or whatever, what would be the next step? Like, would they reach out to you? Do you have a certain uh, place on your website that they would go to? Yeah. So there's a, I have a ton of free resources on my site. I actually have a garden suite page set up on my site right now. And uh, we're finishing up a guide that uh, we will send to people if they're on our email list. And then that way 
you know, we will educate them as much as possible about their current site and what sort of things that they need to look for. And, uh, and then hopefully, you know, they will have properties in their existing portfolio that they will qualify from. Um, and uh, the thing that's also very uh, useful is that they can contact the city, right? So you can either email the city or give them a call. Um, and they usually are very, um, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're very responsive in terms of providing information. So they'll tell you what the rules are for your specific property. So if any of your listeners have a specific property that they're interested in, I think the best thing to do is to just contact the city and say, I'm interested in putting in a backyard garden suite or whatever the name is for that city. I would encourage your listeners to do a little bit of research online first. If you go into the city, for example, in Hamilton, they're called detached SDUs, right? So their uh, SDU stands for secondary dwelling units. That's what they're referred to in Hamilton. That's what the planning department, that's what the building department understands them at. So if you reach out to this, uh, to the planning department at the city of Hamilton and say, hey, I have a house at, you know, this address. Is it something that I can, is this something that I can, um, uh, you know, add a secondary dwelling unit in the backyard and what would be the implications? And they'll be able to give you some answers or direct you to some resources. Yeah. Uh, take advantage of the resources with the city. There's a lot of good information on the city websites. Awesome. Okay, cool. So uh, why don't we s- jump ahead to the next section, which is a random five. I'm just going to ask you five questions and you just okay. tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Um, <laughs> okay. Number one, what was your best birthday? My best birthday? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard to, I've had a lot of good birthdays. So I'm just going to say my most recent one where I, I just spent some time with my family outdoors, uh, did a hike. And we found um, two four-leaf clovers cool. right beside each other. That's awesome. My kids. So that's pro- I'm just going to say that's probably my best birthday right now. All right. Awesome. Uh, number two, pancakes or waffles? Um, my wife made some really good um, cottage cheese pancakes recently. So I'm going to say pancakes right now. Make sure your wife's happy. <laughs> um, number three, what accomplishment are you most proud of? Um, I would say probably just when people uh, you know, respond back to me and say that, uh, and this is not one specific, you know, time or anything like that, but just when people respond back and say that, you know, the information that I've given them allowed them to do whatever project and they've had success with that. To me, that's kind of the most fulfilling part of my job. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, number four, what's your best habit? Uh, my best habit is, uh, I don't know. That's a good, that's a good question. Probably, um, probably coffee in the morning and getting, getting to work pretty much right away. (laughs) (laughs) All right, cool. Um, number five, what's, what's one of the great values that guides your life? That one's, that's a deep one there. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's certainly a deep one. Um, I think it's just kind of the realization that, uh, you know, uh, the world is full of abundance and, um, you know, looking forward to learning more and getting more experiences just so that I can contribute more back. That's really one of the guiding principles. And whether it's giving back to, you know, my family and kids or the community, yeah, um, I think that that's, uh, that's something that I kind of focus on. Awesome. Um, yeah, well, thanks for sharing all that. Uh, do you want to tell people how they can reach you? And obviously the services you provide are pretty obvious, but maybe yeah. just share how they can reach you. <laughs> Yeah, sure. If you go to my website, uh, pretty simple, sweeteditions.com. Um, I have a ton of free resources there. I'm also on social media where we try to put a lot of good video content, uh, you know, just kind of in the trenches on the projects that we're working on. People have said that the information is really useful. Yeah. So you can find us on, on YouTube. Um, and then we also have training programs that guide people on kind of the step-by-step process on doing all of this. So I definitely recommend uh, for your listeners to check out our website. It's uh, sweeteditions.com. Yeah, I have to say, I, I follow you on social media and I do find your, your videos really helpful and informative. So keep doing that. That's great. Thanks. Yeah. I'm glad someone's watching it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks, Andy. Appreciate all this. And um, yeah, I'll be sure to uh, you know put all your information on the show notes and just, we'll, we'll stay in touch. I look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. 
As always, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the content. And if you did, I ask you to share this with a friend, with a family member, somebody who might benefit. And it's always appreciated if you can leave us a review, especially if you're listening to it on the Apple Podcasts app, or if you're on YouTube, give us a like, subscribe, comment, and your support is always appreciated. Thank you very much.